feel like we've been on this expedition for an age, Louis. Oh my god! It's a trail! We're through these damn mountains! The, the rivers can't be far ahead! I say, do you still have that nut ration? Good. Is that enough? Would you mind, uh... I think we should count the nuts. You should count the nuts? Bye, Lewis! You can keep the nuts! Say hello to Lewis and Clark, a game that has been on Board Game Geek's hotness sidebar for so long you might find your copy has developed a hardened crust of hyperbaton. Quickly, I should just have an aside where I explain this weirdest of board gaming accolades. Excellent, yet astonishingly misogynist community Board Game Geek has a sidebar of games called The Hotness, which is based on nothing more than how many people visit that game's page. So a game being on the hotness causes more people to visit its page, as does people not having heard of a game before, or needing rules, explanations, which to me always made the hotness feel less like an effective barometer for hype, and more like geeks hotboxing a car which isn't even travelling where you want it to go. <coughs> <coughs> oh shit. Where are we? Oh, it's the Game of Thrones board game again. That's cool. Still, learn to see through that purple haze of purple prose, and you can learn a lot, which is why we were still excited to get our hands on Lewis and Clark. Now, in this game, all players lead expeditions from one side of America, down the mighty Mississippi, up some mountains, down some mighty other rivers, to get to the west coast. And just look at this board. It is gorgeous. Notice how it's a warped period interpretation of America with strange dimensions. It's stunning. And uh, still stunning is the warped period interpretation of Native Americans, which are referred to as Indians throughout the manual, and red. Fun trivia that our American audience will probably already know, Columbus named Indians as such because he thought he was in India. Still, the challenge in Lewis and Clark is fascinating. There's no other word for it, all right? This is a straight up race. The first player to reach the West Coast wins. And you'll all start off with some boats and a reference card and a team of people and one Native American. And you'll need more. You'll need lots more supplies to make it to the West Coast efficiently. You'll need food and you'll need supplies and you'll need furs. You'll need wood. You'll want uh, boats, canoes, then you'll want horses as well. You'll also want some more celebrity sort of famous people to join your gang of people. You'll want to expand your boats and you'll want more Native Americans, of course, because they're useful. And when you want, when you've used all your cards and you want to pick them back up, you're going to want to make camp. But understandably, all this stuff you've got in your expedition will slow you down. And perhaps less understandably, this penalty can become negative. So if I made camp with all this junk and these Native Americans and these people who I haven't yet used, my scout would go backwards. In fact, with all of this stuff, my scout would basically end up in France. So the challenge in Lewis and Clark is that you have to have this engine that you have to build of boats and supplies and people, but you want to be 100% efficient. And then, theoretically, your scout will be a ways up the trail, and with no penalties, your camp token will slide all the way up the trail to join him. Then you pick up your cards again. Speaking of which, let's get to actually how you play, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. So, like many modern strategy board games, Lewis and Clark actually bolts multiple systems together. The first of these systems, with no real solution we're going to look at, are your cards. You all have a team of unique cards with beautiful art, your own team of weirdos, and all of these cards do different things. For example, my dog can be sent off to get food. However, all of these cards must be powered by an additional card. So you must flip that card over so it shows its Native American symbol and use that to power the card. And yes, that means you can take Native Americans from your expedition and use them to additionally power cards, you see? Now, never mind the fact that you're going to have to throw away one of your options in order to use any other option. Most of these cards bring in supplies, and supplies is the first thing we'll look at. As you get these beautiful hex wooden things and fill up your boats, well, take a look at the boats here. 
These sun symbols at the top are what you should be looking at. This first one means if this boat contains one thing, this whole boat will slow you down by a day. This big heavy one means every single thing in it is going to slow you down by a day per hex. Similarly for the uh, Native Americans, you can have one Native American, but every additional one you have will slow you down by a day. And once you've taken these hexes on board, you can't get rid of them till you use them. So if you fill up your boats, you might just be now, another weird thing that's going on with these cards is that when you gather supplies, you don't... <laughs> okay, look here. See how this guy who gathers the supply token, the grey hexes, has a grey symbol, all right? And then I'm going to use the woodcutter who has a wooden symbol. Those cards then go down once I've used them, and if anyone else gathers wood or supplies, they can use my symbols to gather double, because thematically, I guess, the expeditions traveling through the wilderness are setting up a kind of infrastructure, so if everyone's getting food, everyone knows how to get food. But then, if people make camp and pick all their cards back up, there's no more symbols on the table anymore, and you're just... F the last two cards in your hand I'm going to look at are... <laughs> This guy, the expedition leader, who's incredibly important. He lets you spend food or canoes to get across, to send your scout across water spaces. Incidentally, supplies are used to pick up more cards. No, furs are used for cards, supplies are used for, I don't even know, it's complicated. And then the last guy you have is your interpreter. The interpreter can get you more Native Americans. And now we move on to the second, second part of the game. So this whole second area of the board is what's referred to as a worker placement game. The other thing you can do on your turn is take one of the Native Americans in your uh, group and send them to, for example, earn two wood. Or in this case, turn two wood into a canoe. Or go here and spend three wood to get an additional boat for your, for your expedition that locks onto the side of it in a really beautiful sort of uh, vista. Uh, and then the interpreter, and this is clever, again you're playing with your friends because when the interpreter happens all of these spaces are freed up again. Because everyone goes to the powwow space, which might be racist, I don't know, and can take as many Native Americans as they want. But what happens if you do that and you take a ton of Native Americans and then on the following turns your friends fill up the spaces that you wanted? You just... Basically, a good turn in Lewis and Clark looks like this. For my turn, I'm going to use my Expedition Commander with Robert Fraser. That's two native power. I'll use a third, allowing me to use him three times. I'll burn two food and one canoe to move my scout up eight spaces. Bef then I will buy someone with two furs and one supply from the market. That's a one-day penalty. Otherwise, I'm clear. So when I make camp at the end of the turn, I move my camp forward seven spaces and pick everybody back up. Like a boss. And a crap turn in Lewis and Clark looks a lot like this. Oh, it's in my turn. Oh, bollocks. It's an intimidating suite of options to be sure, but not an unappealing one. That core challenge of just going down the path keeps you grounded. And the game is lateral enough with so much gorgeous theme that players can immediately go to whatever section of the challenge interests them. In fact, it's almost funny seeing your friends all get their feet stuck in the game's machinery initially. One person starts tearing down way more wood than they know what to do with. Someone else starts filling his boat with natives as if we were running some river bus. You maybe start buying up celebrities with names without even knowing what you're gonna need down the road and your last friend starts going <laughs> backwards. It's funny. It's also though, one of the tensest, most sort of dramatic games we've played in a while. Because it is just a clean race, going so much as one extra space thanks to your genius or falling back a space behind because you forgot something is elating or crushing. So, altogether then, this seems like a great package. Beautiful art, supremely innovative, tough but fair. You should buy it, right? Why don't we go and have a cup of tea? Oh. So, Lewis and Clark actually taught me a couple of things about Euro games, right? I knew about pacing and the importance of that, how you have to design your game to make sure you're not doing the same thing in minute five as you are in minute 105, and usually that takes the form of 
resources, okay? You don't have much to begin with, but by the end you've got so many moving parts that it's a more difficult game, but also there's more at stake. The other thing that I didn't get about Eurogames was secret scoring. So you don't quite know who's winning, and then at the end, the game ends with, not with a bang, but with a clatter of calculators, so that you, you all work out how many points you've got, and then you have that weird thing at the end where you go, how many points have you got? Oh, 20 points. How many points have you got? Oh, 50 points, okay. Stupid game, anyway. Lewis and Clark made me realize why that's important. You're not gonna have your tea? Nice cup of, cup of tea? No? Some people. Here's the dismal truth behind Lewis and Clark. The game gets its pacing from mountains, all right? At the end of this first river, you find mountains, then some more river, then some more mountains. And these require a psychological and tactical gear change. The meat and rafts you've been using to get up become useless, and you need to be able to get horses and guides to take you through the mountains before going back to water, before going back to mountains again. And while this is perfect thematically, in practice, it means the game gets slower and harder when you're already exhausted. Not only that, once you've got your engines together, all those mechanics I talked about before where you're all playing together start to fade away. You'll all get your own means of getting meat and lumber and all that, which means you don't really care what cards your friends are playing so much. And because whenever anyone hosts a powwow, a new Native American is added to this welcome space until there are so many of the things that the economy of them starts to matter less. But worst of all, just think for a second, you'll be able to work out the problem with this without having played Lewis and Clark. Imagine you're just about to approach the first mountain range, okay? You're stealing yourself, you're gonna go across those frosty peaks while your friend has just finished the first mountain range because this is a race and you can see how far ahead they are. That friend is almost certainly going to win the game. And by going to win the game, I mean they're going to do it in about 25 minutes. And that's when you get to the really horrible realization. This game shouldn't have been called Lewis and Clark. It should have been called Lewis and Clark and some dickheads who are following them the entire way. Journal of the Expedition, February 8th, 1805. Met some more Indians today. Yeah, they also were full of stories about how Lewis and Clark passed through here two months ago. So I guess we won't be the first to the coast after all. Still, I'm sure history will remember my name. Sincerely, Lickety Bojang of the Lickety Bojang and Halibut Expedition. For all the fantastic ideas present in this game, which work, for all the unspeakably generous art design which has a beautiful picture on every single card, we absolutely cannot recommend this game for the simple reason that no one on Team Shut Up and Sit Down wanted to see it again after we'd finished our first game. It felt like an expedition, but not in a good way. It felt exhausting and like a trial. And this is why the race games we recommend, the expeditions we recommend, like KT or The Cave or even Formula D, a Formula One racing game, always have the opportunity for total disaster to affect the leader and people to push their luck and come up from behind. Don't be too disappointed though if you were looking for some heavy strategy games because we've got some fantastic games we're gonna be reviewing over the next couple of months. And if you're looking for something kind of educational, there's still Freedom the Underground Railroad, a cooperative game about <laughs> the sl uh, resistance fighters and the slave trade. We like that one a lot. And there's also the ultimate educational game, which is Timeline. You wanna play some Timeline? This is Timeline. You wanna play some Timeline? I'd teach you how to play Timeline, but actually, we're just gonna start playing, okay? Okay, the Lewis and Clark expedition took place in 1804. Do you think that was before or after the invention of the tea packet? Think about it, think about it. Uh, tea packet was invented in 1908. Okay, do you think that was before or after the invention of the croissant? Think about it. The croissant was in 1863. Did you get it right? What about the first report of the Loch Ness Monster? Where does that fit in our timeline? Think about it. Think about it. It was in 535 AD. What about the appearance of bees? Be careful, when did bees appear? Was it, was it before or after? It was about 100, 
million years BC, obviously. Come on, it's bees. Uh, the invention of the traffic light, where's that? Invention of the traffic light, it was 1868. So, uh, five years after the croissant. Is that a coincidence? You decide. Invention of the helicopter. Ah, uh, where's it gonna be? Invention of the helicopter. Here, here, think about it, think about it. It was 1825, obviously. And then finally, the invention of camembert. If you get this right, I will salute you in the comments. Where does it go? Camembert was invented 1790, so right here. That was quite easy, actually, you probably got that. By timeline, look at all these cards, I love it. By timeline, other sets, historical events, or music and cinema. By cardline, globetrotter, which is the same thing for countries. By it all, I love it, it's really good. By...